Okay, I've had some time to cool down. The axe has cooled down. We're all cool now. <laughs> and I can see where I was going wrong. So one thing I've learned over the years is when I start getting frustrated with something, I just need to stop, walk away, go into something else, come back later, and it'll be obvious then what I need to do. So with this, it was starting to drift out from where I want it because this axe, this unusual axe shape, is supposed to be symmetrical. And I don't know how obvious it is on camera, but that is not symmetrical. And it's not symmetrical as it was. <laughs> so it's, the more I was working on it, the worse it was getting. The, the, the further it was getting from the idea I have in my head of where it should be. So we're drifting off that way now. Um, this curve doesn't match this curve. Um, these bits aren't right either. So if you look at this one, they come down like that. And then we've got the edges a smooth curve that way. So we've got sharp curve, gentle curve, and in between curve, I guess. That, yeah. <laughs> so it was on the verge of going catastrophically wrong, um, is what I'm getting at. And it might still do, but <laughs> at least by taking a moment and calming down, um, we've got a chance. So what I'm gonna do now is light up the gas forge. So we haven't used a gas forge yet, this project, and that's partly just because gas costs a fortune these days. Um, but also, it's not capable of getting up to the kind of heat that we would need for forging this type of steel. But we're not trying to move the metal very much now, we're just trying to adjust what we've got here and make it right. Um, and the gas forge does have the huge advantage of not being able to overheat the metal, so we can't burn this because that's a... <laughs> that's an increasing fear as you get near the end of a project if uh, overheat it and burn the metal that bit of metal potentially the whole thing is ruined Nearly there with the shaping, I'm going to um, use a grinder to finish off and just... I could have done it with forging if I'd made up some more tooling, um, which would have taken days, but um, if I made a top and bottom die that was in the exact shape that I want, um, and then put mounted that in the fly press, heated this up, put it in there and crunch like that, flip it over, crumple again, that would do. Um, but equally this will do because this is going to be a one-off isn't it so not much I've got to come in here and a little bit off there and that should give the right shape there remember it's sharp there sharp there and then a gentle curve here 
So that's that with the minimum amount of material removed. And then on the other side, to mirror that side, means taking off a little bit more. So up to quarter an inch down here, I think. So we'll get the grinder on this and see where we are. The rest of it is looking good. The tapers are right. The thickness here is just right. The pole is right. Um, this is all coming down really nicely. And I think I've left enough meat there to put the bevel on as well. It's, yeah, I'm mostly happy. <laughs> but let's finish it off. Most of the outside shape is there, but in doing that, I've realized there's a sort of a dip here in the middle. It goes a bit um, concave just here. So I'm gonna have to heat it up again and smack it there to sort that out. Yeah. It also curves a little bit wrong here. But probably doing that will sort that as well. Once I'm happy with it, I'll punch in my touch mark, put the M in there. Um, I think that's the forging done then. But let's get this bit sorted out because that's uh, pretty critical. Touch mark then, so I'm gonna bang an M in just there. And bear in mind all the things that I said about using undersized tooling in fly press. But hopefully we'll get away with it just as well. I'm gonna use this old chisel as a packer so we don't squash the eye. So while the axe head is cooling down again, I shall make a start on roughing out the handle. I think, now we've got pretty much the final dimension on how the axe head is going to be, I think this is too long. It's probably about that much too long. So this is primarily going to be a, a one-handed tool, but I want enough handle to have two hands if I need. Um, I reckon that's where the head's going to go there. So I think I've got to lose about three inches off of this. But we'll rough it out first and then get a feel for it. I think the ideal tool for this would be a draw knife, but I don't have one of my own. I made one for my dad, and I haven't got around to make my own one yet. I 
I do have a spoke shave, so let's give that a try. I think of a spoke shave as a sort of posher version of a draw knife. Exact same principle. I should probably quit while I'm ahead before I refine it away to nothing. Let's go and see if the accent's cooled down. It's cooled down a bit. That M is certainly in there deep. <laughs> Well, it's finally coming together. Heat treat is next, I think. In front of the forge there, there's my usual tub of olive oil. Inside of the forge, as it's coming up to temperature, I've just put a piece of angeline, and I'm going to pull that angeline out, stick it in the oil, and just pre-warm the oil. Uh, there's two reasons for that, or two that I can think of. One is that um, it raise, raising the temperature of the oil makes less of a temperature shock when you stick the when this goes in there. Um, secondly, it makes it much more runny, which um, and both of those are much more pertinent things um, in the winter because this olive oil actually goes solid um, when it's properly cold. So I'm just going to warm that up until it's too hot to leave my hand in there, so, <laughs> which I'm guessing is about 45 degrees, something like that. Then I'll put this in the forge, and what I'm going to do is just harden the edge. So I'm going to heat it up. I mean, the whole thing will obviously get hot, but I'm going to concentrate the heat here. So I want this much of it to be a nice bright orange, and I'm going to pull it out and then quench it in the olive oil. I haven't done any grinding on the bevel yet. There is um, an argument for doing that at this point because the steel is soft, it's easier to do, but Leaving it like this, with that edge there, means it's much less likely to put any stress into the axe. I mean, I'd be mortified if this axe actually twisted or kinked or anything like that after all those normalisation cycles and such. But it does help prevent that happening by just leaving all that meat there for now.
So I quenched the whole thing because I didn't want a sharp transition between the hardened steel and the unhardened steel. So what we should have is a sort of... Soft and hard is very much um, relative with something like this. I mean, you saw how much effort it took to move it, even when it was uh, annealed and hot. Anyway, so this edge should be as hard as it's as I could get that steel. So I've got a file here. If the edge here is hard, it should skate over it. Not... Yeah. <laughs> See there with the all the files doing is taking off the oxide layer, not touching the axe head at all. So this should be a very, very durable axe made out of this material. And this is the real advantage of making it out of this 5160 or something similar, as opposed to making it out of raw iron and then putting this bit here would be similar steel to what I've made the entire thing out of with this axe. But obviously the wrought iron is much easier to forge, but you can see the result. It's got weak spots all over it, and the forge rod there just popped apart. Now in fairness, this was handmade and well over 100 years ago. At least 150 I'd guess at. This is, yeah. Victorian but still I guess the point I'm trying to get to is that <laughs> this was really hard work to make but it's a it's worth it in the end because it's such a durable piece what I've got here is a hardness testing kit this is um, a Japanese kit and it's just a collection of files which are well themselves made at different hardnesses and then they're marked on here with the um, uh, HR rating and you basically just see which ones will cut into this and which ones won't. If you're going to buy one of these kits and they're great don't try and be clever like I was and buy it directly from the from Japan because I got hit for import fees and it cost more than if I'd bought it from the UK importer so <laughs> Now remember this isn't tempered yet when it's tempered, I'd expect this one to bite into it. Okay, so I'm going to put some scratches in it with the 65. Now this is off to the kitchen oven for um, 230 degrees. I'm going to put it in out for an hour and we'll see what difference that makes. It's a nice sunny day, which means I can use the big oven, which has got a more accurate thermostat. And this is all powered off of solar power, which is nice. I might as well put in a potato for lunch as well. Right, one, so it's 2.30, set. One hour, go. One tempering session done then. Let's see how much we've reduced it by. So we're aiming for 55, ideally. It's still harder than 45. 50. 55. Hey. Yes, I can just about put scratches in with that, which is the 55. That's perfect. I'm going to do another hour at the same temperature and then that's the heat treatment done. If the hardness had been above what we wanted it to be, I'd put it back in for the second hour at slightly higher temperature, maybe add 10 degrees to it and then test it again. But that was spot on, which means that the second hour is just, it's just to be sure. <laughs> Probably don't even need to do it, but I'm going to put it in for another hour at exactly the same temperature just to be sure. That's it, second tempering cycle is done and the heat treatment is now complete. And it's the heat treatment that makes a, a, a tool into a tool rather than just a lump of steel, which it was um, just a few hours ago. Of course, the other thing that's going to make this a tool is to put an edge on it. So that's coming up next. 
So it's over to the belt sander. I'm going to start at 80 grit and work my way all the way up to 600. It's super important to not overheat the edge now because that will lose all that tempering that we've done, all the heat treatment will just <laughs> be ruined basically. And it's quite easy to overheat on one of these, so I should be doing a bit of this and then stick it to There's a bucket of water down here. I'll just keep dunking it in there as we go. <laughs> That's where we are so far. I should say at this point that um, a lot of people with carving axes um, just sharpen them in their chisel grind. So it'd be flat on one side and then beveled on the other. I've not done that because I'm, well for one thing I want, it's not just a carving axe, but for another I'm fairly ambidextrous. I want the option of being able to use it with either hand. I will finish sharpening in a bit. First I'm gonna put the handle on. So I've decided I want it to come down to there. I think that was something like a 20 inch handle, but um, oh, before I put the handle on, let's weigh it and see what the final weight is. One pound, eight ounces. Well, eight ounces and three quarters, so almost nine ounces. One pound, nine ounces. Ooh, that's upside down. Cut a slot first, oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> I wonder if I can make a wedge from the rest of that. Filled the head up quite nicely. I hope that's focusing. That handles really nicely. I'm really happy with that. The indexing is perfect. By indexing, I mean that when I'm holding the axe, I know exactly where the cutting edge is because I've shaped it in such a, an oval. You get a really nice feel for its position. This oversized swell at the end means that it's not gonna fly out my hand no matter what I do with it. It also means there's something to grip if I want to double up on it. Yeah. In terms of ergonomics, <laughs> it's spot on. It's the usual sharpening system I use on all the knives. And this would normally be way overkill for an axe, but remember this is uh, a carving axe, so this is probably gonna be necessary. What these ceramic rods do is just put on a. Actually, we don't need it at 20 degrees. No, let's do it with 25. So, what these ceramic rods do is just put on a micro bevel. So, we've got the, the um, primary bevel is this taper here that goes all the way from here down to here. And then we've got the secondary bevel coming to an edge. And now we're going to put on a micro bevel, just one more. Two angles for these rods at um, 20 degrees and 25 so I'm doing it on the 25 which should be appropriate for that. Yeah. Good. 
Well, so far I'm loving it, but of course <laughs> we need to see if it works. So I've got a hedge over there that I'm going to hack into this winter. Um, and I think we'll find something there that will be a good test. This hedge is due for a whole load of work this winter, but in the meantime, I'm going to trim off one of the branches of this hazel tree. That should be a good test. Right. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that to go quite quick. Other than carving, I can see it's been used as like a forestry axe. So for sledding, I think it's called. Really nice for one-handed use. Work on the aim. Brought a lump of that in just to see what it's like to actually carve if I was going to make a spoon or something. I'm going to drill a hole in it so I can uh, mount it on the wall. Let's see what dimensions we got. So that's 18 and a half inches to there, to the end of the handle. Perhaps 19 and a half inches, absolute maximum. Six and a half and four. Sing that. This is boiled linseed oil, and of course, bear in mind that a linseed oil soaked rag can spontaneously combust, but only if you leave it scrunched up. So after that chopping, has it kept an edge? That's the question. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Actually, that brings me to something I was going to mention. Um, and here's my tip for the day. If you have a broken handle in an axe, don't just chuck the axe in a bonfire or on a barbecue or anything like that to burn out the handle, because that all that heat treating you've seen me do here, that will undo it. <laughs> and then you'll be able to get an edge on your axe, but it won't be able to keep it because it will have lost its hardness. Well, that I'm very happy with. That took a lot of effort, <laughs> but we got there. It took about twice as long as I expected it to. But, uh, Probably the case of all my projects, thinking about it. Along the way though, I think I've got an idea as to why you don't see this pattern anymore. This is just my idea from making this one. The reason we don't see this pattern so much is because when you're forging out of tool steel, the entire thing out of tool steel, as you would with a modern axe, 
When you punch the eye and then you start to form the axe, it naturally starts to form this shape. So as you're fullering out to make this taper here, it will start to, the metal will start to fan out like that. So it's, it's already on its way to being this shape. And when you're making the whole thing out of tool steel, you want to minimize the amount of forging. Whereas this, this would have been handmade out of wrought iron and wrought iron is much easier to forge into whatever shape you want. So all this bit where it comes in here and out here, that's all extra work, which when you've got to do that extra work in a very hard steel like this one, that really is extra work, <laughs> if that makes sense. And I reckon that's why we've just sort of standardized on what I would call the American pattern, this, this one here. Making this, the Kent pattern axe, in wrought iron or mild steel, and then putting a cutting edge in there, would be much easier. The actual forging the shape would be much easier, but you'd have a much less durable axe at the end of it. Those bits there, where it's broken on the forge weld, where it's broken here, that's just not going to happen with this. No matter how much I abuse this, it's <laughs> it's going to be the handle that breaks, not the not the head. I mean, having said that, that probably lasted 100 years before it broke, so these things are relative, I guess. Well, that's it for this project. And what an adventure it was. And it nearly got away from me at one point. But I always say, if you can picture something in your head, you can make it. It might just take a while. And... Uh, we got there in the end. <laughs> it, was, it was hard work, but it would have been much harder work without the fly press. What a fantastic bit of kit. And nearly all the tooling held up. The slot punch was the biggest failure, but it's easy enough to make a new, more heavy duty one. And this is going to be a real boon in the workshop for future projects. Well, I hope you enjoyed watching that as much as I enjoyed making it. And I did enjoy making it despite the odd moment of anguish. And it's, it's those moments that actually make the outcome worth it, if you see what I mean. Somebody commented on a recent video I did where we hiked across the eye of sky saying it just looked like hard work. They couldn't see the appeal. Well, this is also hard work, but in both cases, it's the hard work that pays off <laughs> and you get something to show at the end of it. Anyway, that's enough philosophy. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers for now.